Ptolemy Auletes, an illegitimate son of Egypt's king, Ptolemy Sotter, was born approximately nine or ten years before the rise of Gaius Marius in Rome. His birth was soon followed by that of a younger brother named Ptolemy, and likely a sister named Cleopatra as well. Their father, Ptolemy Sotter, had ruled as co-regent, first under the thumb of his grandmother, Cleopatra II, and then his mother, Cleopatra III. As was tradition for the eldest son, Sotter was married to his eldest full-blooded sister, Cleopatra IV, who was surnamed Cellini, and Sotter anticipated his sister wife becoming Queen of Egypt upon the death of his mother. Unfortunately, his mother preferred his younger brother, Ptolemy Alexander, and so, when his grandmother died and his mother took hold of Egypt's reins, she forced Sotter to divorce Cellini, and then she sent Cellini to Syria to be married to Antiochus X as part of an ongoing alliance between Egypt and Syria. Sotter was then dethroned by his mother, in favour of her younger son, Alexander, whom she made her co-regent, exiling her eldest son to the island of Cyprus. It was this son, Alexander, who, likely in hopes of preventing further manipulation of the Ptolemaic throne by the women of his family, bequeathed the kingdom of Egypt to Rome. But Alexander went so far as to murder his mother, Cleopatra III, allowing Sotter to return from Cyprus and reclaim Egypt's throne, along with his daughter, Berenike III. Sotter, however, neglected to take care of the important legal necessity to nullify Alexander's will by putting in place a will of his own, which instead named his children the rightful heirs of Egypt. The dictator Sulla cunningly leveraged Alexander's will, the only existing document on file in Rome, to force Berenike, who had no legitimate right to rule Egypt because of her father's blunder, to marry her cousin, whom Sulla judged to be supportive of Roman interests. After Berenike was murdered by her cousin, only days after their wedding, Alexander was lynched by the Egyptian people. In 88 BC, when Mithridates of Pontus first declared war on Rome with the invasion of Turkey, and the organized execution of approximately 150,000 Roman and Italian citizens, Ptolemy Auletes and his brother, who lived on the island of Kos, were taken hostage. They were forced to live for the next eight years at the court of Mithridates in Pontus. It was only after their half-sister, Berenike III, was murdered, that the Egyptian people demanded their return, and the dictator Sulla put pressure on Mithridates to release his hostages. Auletes was crowned king of Egypt, and in accordance with Ptolemaic custom, his younger brother was crowned king of Cyprus. But Auletes' ascension to the throne was only the beginning of his troubles. Because he was born to one of his father's Greek concubines, instead of a royal aunt, there were plenty to challenge his claim. This included the sons of his aunt, Cleopatra Cellini, whose Syrian son, having been chased from his throne, had gone begging to Rome to grant him rule of Egypt. This forced Ptolemy Auletes to match copious amounts of bribe money, paid to the Roman Senate by Antiochus XIII, in an attempt to tilt the Senate in his favour. In 65 BC, Marcus Licinius Crassus, who was the wealthiest man in Rome, and drawn by the allure of overwhelming riches, began lobbying for the complete annexation of Egypt, based on the conditions of Ptolemy Alexander's original will. Once again, Ptolemy Auletes was forced to produce the necessary gold to ensure Crassus's motion did not pass. And though Auletes succeeded in preventing the annexation of his kingdom at that time, he could see the handwriting on the wall. Rome was coming. Someone would always push for annexation, and eventually, they would succeed. So Auletes began raising taxes, and borrowing heavily from Roman creditors, as a means to further ingratiate himself with Rome. When Pompeius Magnus was in Syria, settling the dispute between Judea's warring brothers, Ptolemy Auletes assumed the physical and financial support of 8,000 of Pompeius's cavalry, and even sent Pompeius the gift of a golden crown. However, when he requested Pompeius come to Alexandria to help him put down a revolt, Pompeius refused. Unfortunately, raising taxes caused widespread discontent in Egypt, and the farmers who worked on Egypt's royal lands went on strike, refusing to work under the burden. By 60 BC, Ptolemy Auletes desperately needed relief, and journeyed to Rome in order to seek it out. The two most important people in Rome were Pompeius Magnus and Marcus Licinius Crassus. 
but, since it was Crassus whose desire for Egyptian gold had led him to motion for annexation, Ptolemy approached Pompeius instead. Pompeius advised him to also seek the aid of the upcoming consul, Gaius Julius Caesar. After raising taxes and borrowing heavily from creditors, Orletes now paid approximately 6,000 talents to Pompeius and Caesar. This represented Egypt's annual revenue. And for his expensive bribe, the Senate formally recognized Ptolemy Orletes as king of Egypt during Caesar's 59 BC consulship. Additionally, the Senate added Egypt to its list of friends and allies of the Roman people. His work in Rome done, Ptolemy Orletes made the journey back to Egypt, where he was greeted by a population angered over the extremities of his taxation, and his making Egypt ever more reliant upon Rome. Ptolemy Orletes was about to lose complete control of his rule of Egypt. In Rome, the new tribunes of the plebs took office at the end of the 59 BC year. Publius Clodius Pulcher, who had renounced his patrician status, and arranged his adoption into a plebeian family for the sole purpose of attaining the tribunate, had long harbored plans of vengeance against Ptolemy Orletes' younger brother, Ptolemy of Cyprus. The Senate's formal recognition of Ptolemy Orletes as king of Egypt gave Clodius the perfect opportunity to avenge himself against Ptolemy of Cyprus, while simultaneously ridding himself, and Caesar, of the one constant thorn in the side of the triumvirs. Marcus Porcius Cato the Younger. Clodius quickly began legislating for the complete annexation of Cyprus, whose relationship to Rome had not been clearly defined in response to Ptolemy Orletes' massive bribes to Pompeius and Caesar. As the traditional seat of power for the younger brothers of Egypt's kings, Cyprus was clearly a part of Alexander's bequest to Rome. But, her autonomy from Egypt also meant that her king sat upon his throne illegally. It was time for Rome to take what was owed her. Given the kind of tactics Clodius used to get things done, and the knowledge that he was now associated with Caesar, the Senate, understanding that Clodius served as watchdog over Caesar's interests in Rome while Caesar, as ex-consul, made his way towards his assigned provinces, voted for the annexation of Cyprus. And because Cyprus, as part of Egypt, had so much wealth, the task of overseeing the annexation could not comfortably be entrusted to someone easily tempted to line his own pockets. Only one man in Rome's Senate had a reputation for successful resistance to riches. And so, Cato was unanimously voted the duty of overseeing Rome's annexation of Cyprus, a responsibility which would keep the arch-conservative thorn removed from the Senate for approximately two years. When Cato arrived in Cyprus with the news that the kingdom was now a part of the Roman Empire, as an extension to the province of Syria, Ptolemy of Cyprus was devastated. Cato advised him not to resist, as his small kingdom was fully unprepared to take on the might of Rome. Promising to put Ptolemy under his personal protection, Cato, as the administrative head of the annexation, offered Ptolemy the position of high priest of Paphos, along with a very generous pension. Choosing, instead, to die as a king, Ptolemy of Cyprus took his own life. In Alexandria, news of the suicide of King Ptolemy, and the annexation of Cyprus by Rome, were added to the fury of the Egyptian people towards their own king, Ptolemy Orletes. Laying the fault at his feet, the people accused Orletes of betraying the interests of Cyprus by scraping and bowing to the Romans. He had plenty of gold for securing his throne yet couldn't offer something on behalf of his brother. That Ptolemy of Cyprus, as king of his own domain, had the sole power to consult with Rome, did not fly with the Egyptian people, already outraged over the severity of Orletes' taxation. Amidst riots and violence, Ptolemy Orletes was forced to step down in favour of his sister-wife, Cleopatra V, and his eldest daughter, Berenike IV. Taking his youngest daughter, Cleopatra VII, Orletes fled the country. Mm.